At His Excellency, the Deputy President, has persistently made utterances threatening to discriminate, exclude, and unlawfully deny sections of the people of Kenya and regions of the Republic of Kenya equal opportunities for public service appointments and allocation of public resources. Ground number two, gross violation of Articles 147.1 and 152.1 of the Constitution by undermining the President and the Cabinet and the effective discharge of national government's executive mandate. That His Excellency the Deputy President has made unilateral statements inconsistent with policy positions collective, collectively adopted by the government and contradicted the President on critical matters of governance and the exercise of the president's function as a symbol of national unity. Three, gross violation of Articles 62, 102A, 174, 1861, 189.1, and the fourth schedule to the constitution by undermining devolution. That His Excellency the Deputy President interfered with the running of Nairobi City County Government by inciting citizens against lawful directives of the county government on the planning and relocation of markets and publicly disparaging the leadership of the county government and its decisions. Four, gross violation of Article 161 of the Constitution on the institutional and decisional independence of judges. That, His Excellency the Deputy President has undermined the institutional and decisional independence of a judge through public attacks on a judge of the High Court of Kenya and falsely threatening to file a petition for the removal of the judge of the said judge in a matter in which he was a party. Five, gross violation of Article 3.1 and Article 148.5a of the Constitution on the fidelity to the oath of office and allegiance that His Excellency the Deputy President breached his oath of office and allegiance on account of the utterances and actions attributed to the Deputy President under Grounds 1, 2, and 3. Six, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes under Sections 13.1a and 62 of the National Coercion and Integration Act. That His Excellency the Deputy President has persistently made inflammatory, reckless, insightful, public utterances over the last two years in contravention of the law. Seven, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed gross economic crimes under sections 45.1, 46, 47A3, and 48.1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act and sections two, three, four, and seven of the Proceeds of Crime and, and Money Laundering Act. That His Excellency the Deputy President has committed gross economic crimes, namely conflict of interest, abuse of office, and conspiracy to commit crimes under sections, under the sections highlighted by in, 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 inexplic inexplicably amassing property estimated at Kenya shillings 5.2 billion, that is incompatible with his non-legitimate income, and by trading with the office of the Deputy President through proxies. Eight, serious reasons to believe that His Excellency the Deputy President has committed crimes by continuously misleading members of the public through force, malicious, divisive, and insightful remarks that are contrary to the provisions of Section 132 of the Penal Code and Section 29 of the Leadership and Integrity Act. Nine, gross misconduct that is incompatible with the high calling and dignified status of the office of the Deputy President, a member of the Cabinet, and a member of the National Security Council. His Excellency the Deputy President has publicly attacked and undermined the work of the National Intelligence Service and its officers. Number 10, gross misconduct by openly or publicly insubordinating the president, who is the head of state and government. 
And number 11, the last ground, gross misconduct by persistently bullying state officers and public officers. Mr. Speaker, the motion is supported by a total of 291 members and as, as contained in the order paper. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in prosecuting this motion, you, it will be remembered that we gave the notice of motion on Tuesday 1st, 2024, and the House also takes public notice that law and procedurally, the Deputy President did address the nation yesterday, and therefore, part of what he said may form part of what I will be talking about. For purposes of members following what I'll be presenting, I choose to be very methodical. I will read the ground. I will restate the provisions of the law that have been violated. I will then briefly state the facts constituting the particulars, and I will tie it up finally with the evidence supporting our allegations. This will make it easy for members to understand what it is that we are accusing the Deputy President of doing. In th doing this, Mr. Speaker, I choose to be a prosecutor and I remove my political cap. I will therefore avoid the bravado and machismo that uh, we were, was displayed yesterday on television and we will just talk about the law, the facts, and the evidence. All the members. Mr. Speaker, Order. take Mr. your seats, McClub. Mr. Speaker, honorable members and Kenyans at large, if I do not talk about my departed relatives, it is because I do not think it is proper to use departed relatives to weep public emotions. It is because I do not think it is proper to use departed relatives to seek public sympathy. And therefore, much as I have also departed relatives, I will not talk about them. Mr. Speaker, before I begin going count by count, allow me also to state on two important questions and I want honorable members to listen. Two important things, two things are important that this is an historical moment and it is also a constitutional moment because Kenya under the 2010 constitution has never dealt with the impeachment of a deputy president. However, we have dealt in numerous times with the impeachment of governors. And our courts of law have set the threshold on which impeachments should be considered. And I thought from the onset, it is important for me to set out the threshold on which impeachment should be considered. So that as I take you through the evidence that we have, you can gauge the evidence against what the courts of law have decided. And Mr. Speaker, allow me to read paragraph 31 of Civil Appeal Number 21 of 2014, famously called the Wambora decision. The Wambora decision is now the, the locus for most of the impeachment cases and has been cited with approval by our Supreme Court. In, in paragraph 31, the court stated as follows. Our reading and the interpretation of Article 181 of the Constitution, as read with Section 33 of the County Government Acts, shows that the removal of a governor is the constitutional and political process, underlying constitutional and political process. It is a sui generis process that is quite quasi-judicial in nature and rules of natural justice and fair administrative action must be observed. What I'm going to read is the most important part. The impeachment architecture in Article 181 of the Constitution reveals that the removal of a governor is not about criminality or culpability, but is about accountability, is about political governance, as well as policy 
and political responsibility. Mr. Speaker, the coaching of Article 181 in the Constitution, which relates to removal of a governor, is similar to the coaching of Article 150, which relates to the removal of a deputy governor. And therefore, mutatis mutandis, the, what the Court of Appeal did state that the removal of a governor is not about criminal or capability. It is about accountability, political governance, as well as pol policy and political responsibility applies to the removal of a deputy president. Mr. Speaker, the standard, I am prepared this, uh, this morning to discharge my burden of proof because EU alleges must also prove. And I am ready to discharge it to the required threshold. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, in consideration of the time that I have been given, allow me now to go to the specific grounds. Ground number one, Mr. Speaker, ground number one, 